I believe that photography is one of the most important tools that we have to motivate people to care. Human beings are especially visual creatures. We respond emotionally, viscerally, to an image. I wanted to do this story on the most endangered whales in the world. I settled on the right whale because it was a species that was in my backyard in Massachusetts and New England. It would not be possible to get underwater photos of the North Atlantic right whale because they are so critically endangered but I still needed the underwater photos. And in 2008, the story developed to be a compare and contrast story, to look at the North Atlantic right whale in comparison to their southern cousins in the sub-Antarctic of New Zealand. I didn't know if the animals would actually be there, and if they were there and the visibility was good, I still didn't know if they would let me close. From the moment I arrived, I was just blown away. This is a highly cognitive animal that has social behavior and clearly is intelligent on a level that we don't fully understand. It almost today seems like a dream. It almost seems like it, you know, was something I, I fantasized and wasn't real. It's, it's beyond words, really. When we got to New Zealand and saw how beautiful and healthy the southern right whales were, you realized the North Atlantic population once looked that way, too. We can see instantly that they are much skinnier, that they are covered in scars, that their health is just nowhere near what it should be. To find myself 10 years later and in a place where that species is even more in peril than they were a decade ago is very discouraging. In New England and up and down the East Coast of the United States, their world has vastly changed for the worse. In 2014, scientists were confident that right whales were on a positive trajectory, that their numbers were increasing. There were eight to 10 calves still being born a year. But what we learned is that actually they've been tanking. Not only was the population going down, but the number of calves every year was going down. Scientists have estimated that this population will be functionally extinct, which means it's not going to be a viable population within 20 to 25 years. 20 to 25 years doesn't give us a big window of time. Every day counts and every right whale counts at this point in time. For millennia, these animals grew up in oceans that were boundless. Now there are boundaries, boundaries of nets and fishing gear. When whales hit ropes, they freak out. And as they swim, the ropes saw into their flesh. 70 to 80% of them have entanglement scars. In the end, an unfortunate percentage end up dying, usually of starvation or being overwhelmed by infection. To be present at an, a, a right whale necropsy is sort of an overload of emotions. You know, you can't help but think about moms and calves and grandmothers and, you know, these family units. You're trying to think about what they're saying to each other. What do they know? What ancient wisdom might they possess if we could only tap into that? There's one less member of that family out there. There's a 
high density of ropes out there. Historically, we didn't fish with plastic ropes. In fact, plastic is an invention of the 20th century. One of the most promising technologies is the use of acoustic releases. What ropeless fishing is all about is getting rid of the vertical line and creating a mechanism that allows you to retrieve your gear. It's sort of similar to the way many people open their car. If you're in a parking lot, you can't remember where you park your car, so you press the button and you hear the noise. Same thing with an acoustic release. Mechanically, it will release the rope so that the rope and the buoy can come to the surface and then you can haul your gear. Ropeless gear for right whales means no rope in the water, means no entanglement risk, means we don't have to worry anymore about whales becoming entangled in fishing gear. A picture the size of a postage stamp of a whale doesn't do justice. I believe that if you gather a reasonable group of people in a room anywhere here in our country and show them what's at stake, what we could lose, their choice between simply bearing witness to the extinction of a species that is savable or doing something about it is an easy choice. We just have to figure out what we need to do. And we already have some of those solutions. We know what needs to be done. The government's just really not moving fast enough. What is the impact of the lobster fishery or what is the impact of opening up vast areas of the ocean? What is that impact on right whales and will it jeopardize their continued existence? And they're just dragging their feet on getting that analysis done. So like one of the most important things is get it done and get it done quickly. If we can raise awareness, if we can get people engaged, if we can mobilize them to like call their congressmen, ask them to fund solutions, ask them to fund new technologies that exist, that both the fisheries and the whales can coexist. Our planet functions as this perfectly tuned machine. If you tug on a thread in nature, you'll find it connected to everything else. We're at a moment in time where we need to rally the troops. As long as there's some right whales left swimming in our ocean, it's not too late. What do you do? You have two choices. You can give up and raise the flag of surrender, or you can fight. We choose to fight.